Due Process, winner of 19 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights, and the 2011 Mid-Atlantic Emmy for outstanding discussion series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law in Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. These politicians, they're not, um, they're not angels, but they may not have um, uh, considered uh, taking these bribes but for direct being there. So. so even you, who have prosecuted on both the federal and the state side, have reservations about this kind of case and running this kind of con? Yes, I have big reservations about this. Just one view of the so-called Jersey Sting, the massive federal case that felled dozens of politicians thanks to a con man working for the government and a law enforcement scam that may have determined an election. It was the biggest political bust in state history and the fallout continues, as does the praise and condemnation for a most uncommon case. The role of the confidential informant, the cooperating witness, the government sting. Up next, on Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. spectacular strike against corruption, nearly 50 arrested in a single day, most of them politicians or their operatives, manacled and marched before the cameras alongside bearded men in black coats, but all with one thing in common. They had allegedly taken the bait, not from an FBI undercover agent, but from a convicted con man who critics said had gone fishing. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King, and it's been nearly three years since it all came down with the government claiming a major victory, winning most of the cases, but not without some controversy. An ongoing undercurrent of criticism of what's come to be known as the Jersey Sting. Okay, kid, you can go. If you're old enough, the word sting just might bring back memories like this. Newman in Redford and their super slick celluloid scam. It's a nice car, Hickey. I thought you were the feds myself when you came in. No trouble, Henry. Snyder went for it all the way. But Solomon Dweck is no Robert Redford. And for the dozens taken in by his scam, the politicians charged with taking the bait, the money laundering rabbis, the Brooklyn Hasid charged with marketing human kidneys, the Jersey Sting was all too real. I'm not going to go and do anything until I know the right people and I can meet the right people. To be able to go in. Yeah. That's the whole trick. Go and do the right thing. I'm a generous guy and that's it. I don't donate. I invest, the CW would say, in meetings, in parking lots, at restaurants, luncheonettes, diners, offices, basement boiler rooms, and bathrooms. And the politicians willingly put themselves up for sale. Now, nearly three years later, with charges still pending against five, four have been convicted at trial, two were acquitted, four saw their charges dropped, one died of a Valium overdose. I have no intention of resigning my office. I believe that I am fully capable of carrying out my oath of office and the duties of my office. But like Hoboken Mayor Peter Camerano, a political comer who had just taken office, most of those charged, whether for corruption, money laundering, or even conspiracy to traffic in human organs. This case uncovered a web of corruption that spanned the state. To the government, it was a great success. 
For the former U.S. attorney for New Jersey, it may have helped open the door to the State House. Hey, New Jersey, we did it! But to many in the criminal defense bar... There are very disturbing aspects to the case that do rise to the level of constitutional violations. And even some former prosecutors. He was out there basically fishing uh, for people uh, that he could uh, ensnare. The massive Dweck con. I only deal in hundreds. Oh, right. 10,000 large. And all that's happened since does not add up to the government's finest moment. It is one of the most egregious public uses of informants that I have seen in my 30 year history as an attorney. On the public corruption side, uh, the FBI and the IRS have arrested and noticed for arrest 29 individuals, including assemblymen and mayors. These politicians, they're not, uh, they're not angels, but they may not have um, uh, considered uh, taking these bribes but for Dweck being there. So. so even you, who have prosecuted on both the federal and the state side, have reservations about this kind of case and running this kind of con? Yes, I have big reservations about this. So it wasn't just the giant scale of the scam, the huge number of arrests and charges, but the controversial nature of Dweck. A criminal facing prison for bank fraud turned con man for the government that led two reporters to document it all in a stunning book called, what else? The Jersey Sting. The overarching goal of the story is to take what has now become one of the most important moments in New Jersey political history, a seminal moment, a, uh, a watershed moment in terms of the fact that one governor lost an election shortly afterward and a new governor won an election shortly after. Take this moment and make it understandable because frankly, it was unintelligible. Unintelligible in large part because of Dweck himself, his character, his personal history. He was a, an adrenaline junkie. A gambler and yet a member of the tight-knit Jersey Shore-based world of Orthodox Syrian Jews the son of one of their most esteemed rabbis, father of five, vice president of the deal yeshiva at a six-figure salary, but with what the Jersey Sting authors say was an obsession, a compulsion. Weck had been gambling on real estate from the time he was 19 years old. So now he's still gambling on real estate, but he's also gambling on politics, and he's in the middle of this big game where the U.S. Attorney's Office has him running this scam. It's a scam of a life. And it was all reminiscent of an earlier government scam. The FBI had caught red-handed a half dozen congressmen and a senator accepting money as a bribe in return for favorable legislation. That one, called Ab Scam, run by con man Mel Weinberg. Thirty years ago, that scam brought down a slew of politicians, among them New Jersey senior Senator Harrison Williams. John Innocent will plead not guilty. Trenton's powerful congressman Frank Thompson. The thing speaks for itself. And Camden Mayor Angelo Eriketti. That's what the money is for, is that? That case, too, brought political indictments, impeachments, resignations. Don't push me. And criminal convictions. There are similarities between uh, the Abscam uh, case and the Dweck uh, cases. It also brought the same kind of criticism. Charges of government abuse, fishing expeditions, officially instigated crimes, and the questions raised by using criminals as agents of the law. Questions some say were even more troubling this time around. Mel Weinberg did not um, go out and tape on his own. He, was, he worked with the FBI and all of the tapes were uh, uh, controlled uh, tapes. But Weinberg too was in it to avoid a stint in federal prison. In Dweck's case, for cashing bad checks to the tune of $25 million times two. The man used uh, had enormous motivation himself uh, to do whatever he could in order to gain his liberty, and he went about, many would say, creating crimes. Well, I want to, uh, you know, uh, get you on my team. Little uh, something to start. The Dweck tapes may make you wonder how this fast-talking huckster could have conned or induced anyone to do anything. You know, it's America. You help me, I help you. Still, of the accused four dozen, 
charges so far dropped only against four. Just two acquitted at trial. You couldn't make this up. No, in fact, that was, the, that was the joke that we had with each other, that if we had tried to make it up as a, as a fictional treatment, nobody would ever buy it because they would say it's just too fantastical. So we chose to, to stick with the truth because it was stranger than fiction. And it's just kept getting more surreal. If you're wondering what's become of Solomon Dweck, he's now locked up too. After all that scamming to stay out. Seems he failed to return a rental car, then lied to his FBI handlers about it. So he's looking at a likely long prison stretch on those original bank fraud charges that got this whole thing started. Just one more twist to explore with Bergen County Prosecutor John Molinelli, with criminal defense attorney Joe Hayden, who represented Hoboken Mayor Peter Camerano, and with Jersey Sting co-author Ted Sherman. Welcome all of you. Thank you. For having me. John, let me start with you. And let me take it a little bit out of the context of this case and out of your formal knowledge of the nuances of entrapment. Is there anything in your mind as a prosecutor that troubles you at the notion of having, especially non-professionals, induce the creation of a crime that wasn't already there in order to bring people into the zone of prosecution? It does. Uh, I think any prosecutor, if, if asked that question, will tell you that the last thing a prosecutor wants is to have a case blow up by the time it reaches trial. And of course, when you deal with detectives, undercover detectives, you're dealing with professionals. Whenever you begin to deal with non-professionals um, in the underlying offense, in this, a, a scenario where the, the confidential informant is actually engaged in the crime represents the extreme for law enforcement, it does. It, it expresses itself uh, in rather difficult ways throughout the investigation and the trial. But it's still the judgment call of the prosecutor, uh, looking at what the end result can be. Um, that is what often will allow a prosecutor to say, you know what, I know it's not the best case. I know it represents the, the most difficult of cases, but it's worth it to our office. Okay, that's theory, mm -hmm. John. Mm -hmm. But when you look at this case, mm -hmm. may I ask you to critique your fellow prosecutors on the federal side? You comfortable with what you see? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, the, it's a judgment call. You know, one thing you have to understand, there is always going to be criticism whenever confidential informants are used, even professional CIs, even, even undercovers who are not equated with this type of a case. Um, and that's, uh, we, we take an oath. We take an oath to pursue cases that we believe we can prove in a courtroom uh, and that we know uh, represents a defendant or an accused that actually committed the offense. Uh, for every case like this, for every case that we criticize, there are hundreds of cases that we don't. Uh, and, and that, unfortunately, is not something that we see on the television. We see the, the extreme cases, of course. Now, Joe, you've been around for a while, first as a prosecutor and now, I hate to say it, a veteran criminal defense lawyer. Where does this investigation rank in terms of that question of the use of a non-professional to basically talk to people about whom there is no current evidence of criminal conduct? Well, I, I think your very comprehensive introduction sets the table because the arrest of 44 people is good media. It can bring about a very interesting book, which was written by Ted and Josh. But the question is whether it's social justice and whether or not it brings the criminal justice system to where the citizens want it to be. And I think there's nothing per se unconstitutional for a sting operation if you're investigating known criminality by known criminals. The Abscam and the Dweck investigation was essentially trolling and imposing a character test to see that if certain people were confronted with certain inducements, they would all of a sudden uh, become weak and, and, and create and be involved in illegal conduct. It was not known criminality. I do not believe it's where the criminal justice system should go. United but, but it was legal. It was, it, was, it was legal, yes. It was not entrapment. The question is, is it good social policy? Is it where we want our criminal justice system to go? The United States of America has the greatest rate of incarceration in the world. We have the highest percentage of people incarcerated. I think there's enough crime going on that we don't have to go out and create crime and prosecute it as opposed to investigate known crime and then prosecute that. Here it was fishing and here it was a character test 
And I do not believe that that is the business of criminal justice. Ted, nobody knows this case better than you and Josh. And you've heard these kinds of criticisms over and over again. I know you've tried to steer clear of making a judgment, but surely one formed in your mind as you worked with this material for years. We didn't, we didn't make a judgment on it, but you've got to keep in mind how this case started. And it, it, it might have turned into somewhat of a fishing expedition later on, but it began as a money laundering case. It began where, where Dweck went, went to people that he dealt with for years laundering money and laundered more money. Right, but I don't think that's where the criticism is aimed. But that's how the case but started. Let me come at this a little differently, Tim, because I think it's fair to separate what happened in his real estate dealings, Dweck's real estate dealings, mm -hmm. from the public corruption aspect of the case. Now, you've been around the country. This case has been, I mean, this book has been a hit in New Jersey and around the country. As people have talked to you, as you've gotten reviews, have non-lawyers, people who haven't thought about this from a pure legal perspective, ever raised the question with you of whether there is something uncomfortable about having a con man go to people about whom there is no evidence of misconduct or corruption and induce them into criminal conduct? Is that something that comes up at all? No, every once in a while, yes, but, but pe people look at crooked politicians and want, want justice done. They, 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 uh, unfortunately, you, you hear about politicians and, and a lot of people assume right off the bat that, that, that uh, things might not be all on the up and up a lot of times. So we, we didn't get much criticism on that. Let me ask you that. Uh, that's an interesting question, John, about the hierarchy or the universe of people you're looking at. Are there some areas where, as a prosecutor, you're more inclined to move into this arena of moving into areas where you don't know there's a particular crime being committed, but a con man or an informant may help you? And are there other areas where you're less likely to do it? And is public corruption one of the ones where you're more inclined right. to do it? I, I do not believe any prosecutor takes out a phone book and a dart and just throws a dart at a phone book and says, that's you the person. You don't think that happened I don't think here. so at You all. don't think that's what Dweck actually wound up doing? Actually, it's actually, that was not the case here because there were a number of individuals who, who Dweck wanted to go after at, at different points in the investigation, and the U.S. Attorney's Office wouldn't allow it because there was no, no uh, predication for them going after somebody. Mm -hmm. Every, everyone that they went after was as a result of going to various political operatives and saying to them, show me a, show me a dirty politician. So, Joe, let me just come back to you, John, but let me ask you, Joe, doesn't that conflict with your notion of how this, this scam was run? Well, wait a minute. They went to political operatives. The political operatives were told by Dweck, and if you can get me people who will accept my contributions, you'll get money for setting me up with people. And then the operative in Dweck went to people who hadn't been engaged in any criminality up until that point in time, and they set him up, set him up and arrested him. That, as far as I'm concerned, is not where government should be involved. It imposed a character test as opposed to investigating ongoing criminality. And all the solicitations came from the government side and the Dweck side, as opposed to the requests coming from the political figure side. That is not where government should be involved in, in terms of conducting law enforcement. Richard. I don't... I don't think it's good law enforcement. I interrupted there, you. There, there, are two, there are two elements, there are two overlays that always apply. The first one is assessment. The original, and it's really not unlike a, a wiretap, you make assessments to look at certain individuals. Where I think... But you go to a judge to get a wiretap. Well, no, no, I understand that. I understand that. But we make, you make assessments on who you're going to look at. Where I think many of the, of the individuals that we're talking about, individuals where you say, well, how could this particular individual in any way be connected with what was going on in Deal, New Jersey. That's the spin-off. That's the, that's the unraveling of what occurs earlier on in an investigation. It's not entrapment. I mean, you, you know, in the beginning part of an investigation, if you try to make an assessment of this individual that is maybe 10 layers away, maybe you can't do it at that point in time. But as the case progresses and as it moves forward, that's when you have the spin-offs. it's bad justice. We have, a body. Policy. we have a body that looks at the facts of a case, and that body is called the jury. And that's the ultimate place where it ends up. Uh, we all know it. The three of us know it. We all know it. Your viewers know it. And for some cases, for some individuals where they were acquitted, that's a jury that determined this is somebody that was not otherwise disposed to commit the crime. We're going we're to acquit this person. And it's a heavy burden on the state, and it should be a heavy burden on the state because of the social issues 
maybe the moral issues, but more importantly, the legal issues that are involved, and I support that. But, Ted, most of the people who uh, were arrested entered guilty pleas. That's correct. I can't help but wonder, had Dweck gone completely off the farm as he did with the, um, the car theft that has him back in the pokey, would you have gotten all of those guilty pleas? Would this have been a completely different um, decision to make on the part of the people who were being charged, whether to plea or not to plea? Would they have had a much stronger case once Dwex continued peculiar um, idea of how to um, run his life and his work, working for the government, as, as, as people, what would that have done to this case? Well, as people learn more and more about Dweck, uh, especially in, in some of the cases where, where there were acquittals, it was harder probably for, for the prosecution to get uh, um, uh, pleas out of these cases. Um, and once he's back in jail? We, it's pretty hard to be there, there as a witness if you, when, when, when you point out to the jury that he's in jail for, for serial crimes. So are there people who entered those pleas, do you think, who are saying, ah, timing really sucked for me? Well, perhaps, but keep also remember that, that everything that he did was recorded with surveillance camera and, and, and recordings, and some of those recordings were, were pretty stark. And... and you put that before a jury, and, and where do you go with that when, when people start boasting about what they can do for, for somebody who's just given them $10,000 in cash? Sandy, but, but there, there's a certain equitable insanity in this whole picture. If you, if you look at, at it from 30,000 feet, you had somebody in Dweck who was a professional fraudster who lied and deceived his friends, his business colleagues, and anybody who came into contact with Ted him. Ted says he graduated from high school because he bought off his he cantor. Bought, he, uh, okay. He, 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 faced, he faced potentially 25 to 30 years if he was prosecuted for all of his crimes. He and his attorney came to the government and said, we want to buy our way out. We want to help you in some kind of sting operation. They send them out, not against known criminals, not against people who they had any evidence of criminality, but of people who were out there, he does as best he can to set them up. They prep him before every meeting. In Mike Critchley's case, it was shown that they were texting him during the course of the meetings in the Malibu as to what to say and what not to say. Eventually, this man... Chris is a lawyer, not to defend him. Right, was so pathological <laughs> that, that at, the, at the end of the day, He's involved in some kind of illegal or questionable conduct with a rental car and then lies to his FBI handlers as to what he was doing. His bail is ultimately revoked. And a lot of people who hadn't been involved in criminality up until that point in time all of a sudden become part of a national story. They're, even the people who were acquitted, their reputations will never be the same. There's nowhere they can go to have their reputations unvarnished. And I think there's a certain equitable madness when you look at the whole operation and you look at, at Abscam, do we really want our law enforcement to have these priorities? It's a social policy issue. And the character question you mentioned was debated around the time of Abscam, which is if you throw enough temptation at people, some people will yield, but is that a way that law enforcement should function? Have you got a two second answer to that question, John, implied Wait. in that? Maybe even 20 seconds. Is, because you mentioned a character test, but at the end of the day, is that what the purpose of law enforcement is, to do character tests beyond the question of whether there's crime I, taking place? I don't equate it with a, being a character test. I believe that a prosecutor will and should always make an assessment of why you are choosing this scenario at this time. You can't always choose the people that you have to rely on. Our office indicted Sammy Gravano years ago for murdering a New York City police officer. Our star witness was Richard Kuklinski. So you can't always choose. Well, we have to choose to end this conversation that we'd like to keep going on. I should mention I represented a person who was in the scope of this investigation. He wasn't charged, so there's no need to bring his name up again. Uh, but with You're our thanks lawyer than the rest of to Joe Hayden <laughs> and John Molinelli and Ted Sherman, that's it for this edition of Due Process. But please come back next week for more cutting-edge issues of law and justice. For Sandy and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. So 
why weren't all of these politicians smart enough to realize that this was being laid on the table in such a crass and direct way and a way that could bring them down and yet most bite? I think because uh, the subtlety is something that uh, is lost on them. In other words, they know that they get contributions from uh, people that do work for the town, uh, developers that do work in the town, suppliers for the town, uh, and you don't have to uh, get into a more direct quid pro quo. Uh, so what I think happened is the politicians that were in, uh, ensnared here uh, basically uh, got sloppy and uh, trusted uh, uh, Dweck because Dweck was usually introduced to them uh, through someone that they knew so they spoke uh, more freely than they perhaps should have spoken. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.